Hello, and welcome back to Chemistry Videos with me, Clarissa Sorensen Unruh. Um, today we're going to talk about molecular orbital theory because it's fun, and it's a good time, and it's worth talking about. Okay, in order to talk about molecular orbital theory, we really need to do it, um, we need to set up a contrast. And we need to set up a contrast between molecular orbital theory and valence bond theory. So let's start with valence bond theory. Valence bond theory, which was initially developed by the late, great Linus Pauling, right? And this is what we've been talking about in terms of hybridization. When we talk about valence bond theory, basically the idea that Linus Pauling had was that when you take a molecule, something relatively easy like methane, CH4, and you draw, this is the Lewis dot structure of methane. I've done a little bit of Vesper uh, 3D structure overlapping that. When you look at a molecule like methane, the idea here was that indeed carbon has a valence shell, right? The valence shell of carbon has, oops, it's not 1s, it's 2s and 2p, all right? So it has 2 in the 2s orbital and 2 in the 2p orbitals, okay? And what Linus Pauling said is, okay, well, let's set up an energy diagram here, right? And let's say that 2s is right here, and the three different orbitals of p are right there, okay? Currently, as I've written this out, what I would have is I would have 2ns and 1 in two of the p orbitals. And basically the idea here was he was like, I don't, I can't visualize how that works. How does that work in terms of the overlap with the H's in this particular molecule? That doesn't make sense that you have a sphere and then you have some peanuts and how exactly do they align and such. So basically what his proposal was is let's mix them, right? So let's mix these so that they're all equal energy somehow dispersing towards those H's. All right, so he said, Instead of having these two, what he essentially did is he took one of these electrons from the S and promoted it to the P orbitals, making four orbitals of all equal energy. It mixed one S orbital and three P orbitals, so they became SP, three hybrids. And those equal energy orbitals would each have one electron in them one valence electron. Right in the midst of these valence electrons, since there's one from the carbons, the other half of these hybrid orbitals could be filled by whatever it's attaching to, right? So in this case, the other one electron for, to fill each of these orbitals would come from the H's, okay? And then that would make four equal energy hybrid orbitals that then we could write down as kind of being along the lines of these bonds. I am drawing a horrible version of this, by the way. There is an excellent version of it in the midst of your book. Each of these has kind of a, you know, anti-bonding moment and a bonding moment. We're gonna put the bonding moment along the line of the bond that I've drawn, okay? And they would overlap with the 1s valent shells from the H's. And that's what hybridization is. Mixing the atomic orbitals on the central atom in order to redistribute them and have equal energy orbitals. That's kind of the big idea. The problem with that is that Robert Mulliken, Mulliken, not Milliken, came along and said, well, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever why you would mix the atomic orbitals on the central atom and not mix the atomic orbitals on everything in the molecule. And that idea is the basis of molecular orbital theory. Why wouldn't you mix them all? Why, does the one, why do the 1s's on the h's have to be separate? The answer, of course, is they shouldn't be. They should all be mixed, right? Just throw all of those atomic orbitals into one big pot and then redistribute them across the entire molecule. And then you would have kind of 
equal ish mixing and you would have some redistribution of fairly um, similar energies across the molecule. At least that was the idea. Okay. So, in terms of molecular orbital theory, we're mixing the atomic orbitals across the entire molecule. To do this well requires a lot of computerized work. Okay, so that's the joy and the purview of the p-chemists. They spend their days, if they're researching this at all, um, looking at antibonding and bonding orbitals, and they can talk about the highest occupied molecular orbital versus the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, so on and so forth. Okay, we're going to do the super simplistic version of this. Okay, so here's molecular orbital theory. Mixing the atomic orbitals across the entire molecule. And we're going to start with relatively simple deals, right? Let's start off with some ones like Li2. Right? Li2, and then start off with something like Li2. Let's do Li2, Li2 plus, and Li2 minus, just to get a sense of the kind of ideas that you could have. Okay? All right, in terms of doing this, Li comes to the table with um, kind of each Li comes to the bond that's formed here with one valence electron in the 2s orbital. Okay, so I'm drawing some boxes here. That's how we do expanded orbitals. You don't have to do that, but I'm going to do that. And they each have one starting off. Okay. When these two allies come together to form a bond, they have kind of two possibilities in terms of the bond that can be formed. Right? There is a lower energy possibility and a higher energy possibility. The lower energy possibility would be the bonding orbital. We're going to call this sigma 2s. Okay? And the higher energy possibility is the antibonding orbital, which we're going to call sigma star 2s. Okay? Notice that the star goes along with antibonding here, or the higher energy of the two. And when I put these two electrons together, I'm always going to start from the lowest energy there is, right? So in terms of these two, these two are going to combine and fill the bonding orbital, okay? When we do this, we can get quite a lot of information from this, okay? We can get a bond order. A bond order might tell me something about what kind of bond would possibly form between those two allies, right? The bond order is just the number of electrons in bonding orbitals minus the number of electrons in antibonding orbitals. I ran out of room a little bit, so I'm going to do this like this. And we're going to put parentheses around this so that you recognize it's all one big thing. And then we're going to divide that by 2, right? So in terms of doing this, let's make that a little darker. Don't you love it when markers squeak? Whoa! All right, maybe I should do it in a different color. <laughs> it's really not showing up at all. Hola! Yeah? Maybe? No, still not helping. All right. I did the best I could. That's a divided by. <laughs> it's a really long divided by. All right. So in terms of doing this one, what I would do for the bond order here, and it's abbreviated BO. I don't know who came up with that particular abbreviation, but it's a bad one. But that's what we do. <laughs> All right. So then we get the number of electrons in bonding orbitals. There are two in the lower energy orbital here. Minus the number of electrons in antibody orbitals, none there, right? In the starred ones, right? So antibonding orbitals are the same thing as saying in the starred orbitals, okay? And divide by two. So I get a bond order of one, which might very well correspond to a single bond here, okay? 
All right, so that's all for Li. You can also do, just like we did with expanded configurations for individual elements, you can also tell whether something is paramagnetic or diamagnetic, right? So diamagnetic means everything is paired in one box. Here, this particular Li2 is diamagnetic because it's all, everything has twos. Paramagnetic would mean that you would have an unpaired electron in the midst of the molecular orbitals. And here, we don't have one, but we might eventually. All right. With Li2, I'm going to abbreviate this down because really the focus of what we need to think about is right here, right? So it matters that we have the atomic orbitals on the side, but really the big things that I need to think about are right in the middle. So I'm just going to draw those two. I'm going to say, okay, the stuff that I have to think about are the molecular orbitals. And I have the sigma star 2s just like I did before and the sigma 2s. Now, if I just want to fill in the molecular orbitals, I could just count the total number of valence electrons, just like you did when you were doing Lewis dot structures. So I get two from each Li, right? So two times one valence electron each, but then it's a plus charge. So I'm going to subtract one electron from that, right? Which gives me one valence electron, right? So two electrons minus one. The two electrons here came from the valence electrons from Li's, just like we count up for Lewis dot structures. And then I subtracted one because of the plus charge. Okay. Filling that one electron in, I just get one right there. The lowest energy orbital. And when I do the bond order here, right, the bond order of Li plus, two plus, is going to be one valence electron in the bonding orbitals, no valence electrons in the anti-bonding orbitals, and divide by two, which gives me a bond order of one half. Okay. I never said they have to be even whole numbers, or whole numbers in general. <laughs> I never said they had to be whole integers in any way, shape, or form. You can totally have it half. Okay. If it's less than one, though, if the bond order is less than one, the likelihood that this would actually happen is not very good. So the likelihood that a bond actually forms is not as good as it being one or two or three. Okay. So let me erase this a little bit so that we can do Li2 minus. Um, by the way, just to finish up this thought, recognize that while this was diamagnetic, right, this one was diamagnetic, that one is paramagnetic. If it did bond, it would have the properties of a paramagnetic, um, it would be attracted to magnets and so on and so forth. Okay. All right. And I'm gonna just gonna erase all of the, I'm gonna erase this. So you got the point that it's a half. Crazy. And that halves are not likely to form. All right, let's do Li2 minus as well. All right, let's just do the middles again. The middles, by the way, are molecular orbitals. That's what we're talking about. I'm not really showing the idea of the um, atomic orbitals here. So this part I've eliminated and only focused on the molecular orbital piece. Here I have two valence electrons, right? One electron from each Li. There's two Li's, plus I get an extra electron from that minus charge, which means I have three valence electrons. Okay, just like you did with the Atomic Hotel, you're gonna fill from the bottom up. There's two, there's one there. Fantastic, let's do the bond order on this, right? So the bond order, I'm gonna put it over here. Right, is I have I now have two valence electrons in the bonding orbitals. That's the lower energy ones without the stars, and I have one in the anti-bonding orbital. And then I'm going to divide that by two. Notice again, you get a bond order of one half or 0.5. Likelihood that this will form less. Also paramagnetic because it has an unpaired electrons. If it did form, it would be paramagnetic. The likelihood that it does form, really not so good. All right. So that's the simple ones. Let's talk about something a little more 
interesting. All right, and notice that I'm doing what we call homonuclear diatomics here. That's about all that we go to in general chemistry. Homonuclear diatomics, let's deconstruct what I just said. What I said there is I said homonuclear means the same nucleus, right? So the same atom. And diatomics would mean that there are two of them. So about all that we analyze without computer programs to do so for us are homonuclear diatomics. Maybe a heteronuclear, but it, even that gets a little, a uh, heteronuclear diatomic might get a little tricky depending on what two atoms you're looking at. Okay, so let's do like O2. Right? O2. When you do this, this becomes a little more interesting because when we look at the energy diagram here, and this is of course energy on the side, then if I have the, each of the oxygens, right, each oxygen has a 2s and it has three 2p's. Let me do this over here. Right, and these should be relatively equal energy. And each of those oxygens has six valence electrons. So there's two in S and four total in the two P's, right? All right, so when we do the molecular orbital diagram of these, these are the atomic orbitals along the sides. What we're going to do is we're going to put these together in terms of the molecular orbitals. I have a sigma 2s and a sigma star 2s, just like I did. Okay, But the p's become really, really super interesting. And this is where it becomes a little bit dicey. Okay, P's form not only sigmas, but they also form pi's. And what happens here is that you have, because remember uh, in the midst of P's you could have double or triple bonds, right? So the possibilities of what could be formed here is you could form a sigma for 2P. And in oxygen, that's the lowest energy. And things like carbon, it's not actually the lowest energy. And I wrote these a little bit too low. I'm not going to have quite enough room to make this happen as I should, these should be slightly higher energy because there should be two bonding orbitals that are lower energy than them, actually technically three, and there should be two anti-bonding orbitals higher than the atomic orbitals here. So I'm going to draw in these two P's again in a second. Give me a second. I'm going to do my pi 2p. I'm going to do my pi antibonding. I'm pretty sure that's right. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. 2p. Even I have to look it up. And my sigma star 2p. All right, so this should be right about, my p should be right about here. <laughs> that's a little better. All right, let me do that again. And this is imperfect. You're forgiving me in the midst of my imperfection here. All right, and my P's again should be about right here. And those should be relatively equal to one another. And we knew that there was four P's here. All right, okay. So, when you're filling these, you will be given this empty, it'll be empty, but it'll look like this on the test. So you can fill the atomic orbitals if you'd like, or you could just count up the total number of valence electrons from that molecule, like you did for Lewis dot structures. Six times six electrons times two gives me a grand total of 12, and then fill the boxes from the bottom up. Either way works, okay? So in this case, notice that I have four total from the S's. So there's two, here's four, right? And I have 
four total from each of, or four from each of the two P's of the oxygens here, so that makes eight. Two, four, six, eight. Does that make sense? I hope so. So grand total, if you had done it from the bottom up for 12, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. Okay, remember just like you did with the P's, you have to fill one in each equal energy box before you fill any with two. Okay, the bond order here for O2 is going to be the number of electrons in the non-starred orbitals, right? So I, in, the, in the bonding orbitals, the lower energy ones, I have two, four, six, eight valence electrons in the bonding orbitals. And then I subtract out the number of electrons in the antibonding orbitals, the starred ones, right? So I get two, four. And I divide that by two, which means that this has a bond order of two, which might correspond a bit to the fact that it forms a double bond between these two O's, right? And then you can also figure out whether this molecule is diamagnetic or paramagnetic. And indeed, this particular molecule, O2, is paramagnetic because it has unpaired electrons, okay? Like I said, on the test, you're going to be given the setup, because I don't expect you to just be able to come up with whether pi electrons are lower energy or sigma electrons are lower energy in p's. All that I need you to do is figure out how to fill it, always fill from the bottom up because it's the lowest energy first, and then figure out whether something is paramagnetic, diamagnetic, and what the bond order is. Okay, and that ends, that unfortunately ends our time today. Until I see you again, adieu.